Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, food loss and waste advisor and producer of the USAID Kitchen Sink. Today, I will be speaking with Robert Lee, co-founder and CEO of Rescuing Leftover Cuisine. Together, we will discuss what food rescue is, how it has been shaped by policies and regulations, and how to make the economic case for food rescue. Welcome, Robert. Please introduce yourself. Hi, Nika. Thanks for having me. My name is Robert Lee. I'm uh, born and raised in uh, New York City and, uh, you know, very, very passionate about food rescue. Used to work at JP Morgan in asset management before quitting my job in 2014 to do this full time. And it's incredible to be here. And thanks again for having me. Thank you for joining us. So let's let's dive right in. And let's get started with some basics. Can you provide some background on rescuing leftover cuisine? How did you get started and how are you evolving? Yeah, we at Rescuing Leftover Cuisine got started actually out of a university club at NYU that used to actually bring leftover dining hall food um, to homeless shelters nearby. And honestly, I just, you know, I came across the club in my first week at NYU and just got so obsessed with it. They were just, you know, I, I honestly thought that it was just uh, incredible to kind of, you know, take this excess food. And, you know, my own personal background, you know, made me kind of, uh, of course, initially interested uh, in the work um, because I, uh, my parents uh, kind of came here uh, with a very typical kind of immigrant story where essentially they were looking for a better life for their kids, but uh, they didn't know the language and they struggled. And so I grew up thinking food insecurity was normal and that everyone was struggling with, you know, finding food and having one meal a day and watching my parents skip meals and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I, that club that really kind of spoke to me and, and I wanted to help it, you know, work on weekends and stuff like that and rescue food, not just from, you know, one dining hall, but all the dining halls and, you know, the, the various kind of Argo teas on, on campus and stuff like that. Um, so that's that's how we got started, really, as a as a very grassroots organization working with these dining halls. It was called Two Birds One Stone, uh, and we essentially, you know, in our last year of college, we decided to kind of you know uh, kind of think about how we can expand the concept of the food rescue kind of space into not just dining halls and not just kind of college campuses, but also kind of the you know for profit businesses that had you know, existed obviously all around uh, New York City. And so we entered into a venture competition. We didn't win first place, we won second place, <laughs> won some seed money uh, and, and and got started and, and, and started rescuing the cuisine. So yeah, it's been crazy to think about, but 11 years since then, since we started in 2013. And uh, ever since we've been looking to continue to grow, expand the, you know, the operations we have. Uh, we continue to rescue food from all kinds of different food businesses, such as bakeries and restaurants, of course, but also now expanding into all kinds of different uh, food businesses, such as consumer packaged goods products uh, and manufacturers, uh, as well as you know retailers and various uh, you know even food film productions and stadiums, which is which is incredible. Wow, definitely a lot of expansion there. And, and I appreciate you you sharing your genesis. That's a, a common theme with the, the entrepreneurs and the change makers that we talk to on the podcast, that a lot of this interest in food loss and waste happens in college. So it definitely seems like a really um, a target target area for, for in, in getting youth interested in the food loss and waste space. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and I, I know you mentioned 
you know, how you are expanding where you are collecting this food. Can you speak to where the food is, is heading to after that? Absolutely. Yeah. The way our, our model works is we partner with uh, all kinds of different nonprofit recipients as well, such as homeless shelters, soup kitchens, food pantries, uh, even schools and associations that provide food to the food insecure. And we really rely on them to be the distribution and, you know, provide the right types of food that they can actually use uh, and distribute. Uh, for instance, a food pantry may not have a kitchen or a facility to process food so they can, you know, accept, you know, canned goods and, and shelf stable things. But a homeless shelter may have an actual kitchen and staff to process ingredients and to make it into meals and things like that. So we kind of do that matchmaking um, both on our website as well as kind of, you know, within our team to ensure that the food is going to where it needs to be. Definitely. And and we've we've had some other conversations with um, those in the food rescue and food donation sp space. We have another episode planned with a food bank. So a, a lot happening in, in this space. And Definitely something that comes up in those conversations are how policies and regulations around food rescue are shaping these models. The Food Donation Improvement Act has come up. So can you share um, your experience working with and perhaps around these policies and regulations and how it has shaped um, rescuing leftover cuisine? Absolutely. It's, it's so exciting to kind of see, I think, you know, thinking about when we first started, honestly, people didn't know that food rescue was okay to do. <laughs> People would tell me to stop what I'm doing and, and that I'm, what I'm doing is wrong and that it's illegal and things like that. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, learning from organizations uh, like City Harvest and Food Bank really helped us kind of understand that there was a, you know, a law, Bill Emerson Gets Nerentin Act of 1996 that protected food donors from legal liability, except in the case of gross negligence, of course. but you know, there were just, uh, I think, a lot of myths kind of going around at the time we started. And, you know, now it's just, it's just so exciting to see how much uh, kind of awareness there is about food rescue and about the fact that we can rescue our food and that we can donate. And in fact, there are enhanced tax structures, there's, there's incentives uh, to do this. And, you know, you can reduce your food disposal costs, you can, you know, obviously contribute to your, you know, uh, neighborhood and your community. Uh, and kind of be associated with a, you know, community focused uh, green kind of mission. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, the policies and the regulations kind of around food rescue have really um, been uh, really kind of pushing more food rescue kind of organizations forward and helping us, you know, continue to expand and grow. There's a lot of exciting kind of, you know, developments, as you mentioned, the FDIA, uh, the Food Donation Improvement Act, uh, I believe now, I think, I guess, two years ago. Um, I, was, uh, I always used to say last year, but I guess it's now <laughs> two years. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it really helps uh, that that specific piece of regulation has specifically helped uh, a lot of schools and a lot of different organizations kind of come on board uh, and rescue their excess food as well. It's been incredible to kind of see, you know, the adoption of food rescue as a solution, not just for, you know, uh, wasted food and food insecurity, but also for the environment. There, there's just so much, so many natural resources, obviously, going into producing our food. And then the fact that, you know, wasted food goes to landfill and doesn't get to go through the normal processes and contributes to, you know, far, far, you know, more harmful gases and carbon emissions. And so... In general, it's just exciting to see so much more awareness uh, and, you know, the, 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 the regulations and the policies overall continue to evolve and grow with, you know, different organic waste bans and things like that. And hopefully Food Rescue can be a part of that and, and be kind of either mandated or at least encouraged. Uh, I think, um, you know, as further kind of clarifications and additional protections come out, I think it's also really important to think about incentives too. I mean, the enhanced tax deductions are great, but a little bit hard to kind of calculate and, and a little bit hard to kind of, you know, actually, you know, get. And so, you know, we see a lot of really great momentum, but obviously still quite a lot to do. Robert, you raise a lot of a lot of great points in your response. Definitely the need for awareness raising is a consistent theme in the food loss and waste space. 
And that's, I think, on really all ends of the spectrum uh, in terms of, you know, communicating to consumers what they can do to reduce their own food waste, uh, really emphasizing the impacts of not tackling the issue of food loss and waste that USAID, we call these the triple win opportunities of reducing food loss and waste, making those connections to climate, nutrition and food security and economic development. Um, but of course, even if we are able to, to raise awareness of, of the impacts and the opportunity in the food loss and waste space, many people from consumers to companies are not going to make those changes unless it makes financial sense. And you also raise this idea of financial incentive. So I'd like to hear from you um, a little bit more on, on making this business case for food rescue. And can you speak to what's next? What's on the horizon in the food rescue space? Yeah, I mean, yeah, everything you said is you know spot on. I think there's there's just so much happening in the food rescue space. And I think as we get closer to, you know, the 2030 kind of um, you know, carbon emissions goals and, and kind of objectives and things like that, I think food rescue is just going to continue to be highlighted as you know uh, one of the you know very serious kind of you know uh, solutions uh, to a lot of the issues that we have, and I think that because of that, there's just going to be a lot of renewed uh, or continued at attention and focus on food rescue as a solution, uh, and hopefully more kind of resources, obviously, kind of going towards that, um, as well as more attention and people kind of you know being focused on the solution. Um, the financial incentives, I think, are key for food businesses to be involved in the space. And I think that as that attention kind of comes to the food rescue space, I think a lot of, um, you know, kind of attention also needs to kind of think, be thought about or be directed towards making the financial case more clear, right? The enhanced tax sections are, as I mentioned, really, you know, uh, great, but still a little convoluted and still a little, you know, difficult to actually, you know, receive. Maybe reducing food disposal costs can also help and, you know, reducing food, you know, waste in general is, is also really great, obviously, for food businesses to not be producing that food uh, and save on that kind of bottom line. Um, but ways to market the fact that, you know, food businesses are actually donating instead of throwing away the food and thinking of ways to increase revenues <laughs> rather than always thinking about the costs uh, is also really, you know, I think exciting kind of opportunity for the food rescue space uh, as we move forward. And as we don't have to kind of continue to make the argument that it's illegal or, you know, like, you know, dispelling that myth, I think we can, as a food rescue space, kind of start to talk about, you know, how to capitalize on, on being a part of this movement. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, it's it's really within our lifetimes that we're going to see kind of consumers really, you know, expecting and demanding that their food businesses, you know, donate their excess food instead of throwing it away. And, you know, as this becomes the universal standard and as more competitive pressures kind of build up, I think, you know, truly it would be not just, you know, uh, expected that, you know, food businesses do this. But also good for them to do it and to you know uh, actually donate and get incentives uh, to do it um, as a whole. So that's uh, you know what I'm seeing and what I what I hope to kind of see over the past, you know over the next few years. But overall, it's just a very exciting you know time to to be doing this. Yeah, there's definitely a growing momentum in the food loss and waste space, which is much needed. As you pointed out, 2030 is not that far away. We are running out of time to, to reach our sustainable development goals. So a, a lot needs to be done in the space. So I'm, I'm excited about the momentum, but we need to keep, we need to keep pushing. And, and I, I know you mentioned these pressures on, on companies to kind of get with the program and, and see the benefits. So I'd like to ask you where you think, uh, that pressure would be best applied is is it coming from the consumer is it coming from policy like where do you think are the the stakeholders that are truly at play in this yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question i think in, in general uh my belief is that kind of dollar votes are really key and i think that all of us as consumers really have the ability to kind of influence things like policy right and obviously policy is important um and you know uh, has a place uh, in all of this to 
um, not just kind of encourage it, but also hopefully, you know, mandate it at some point and things like that. But I think it does start with uh, us as consumers really, um, you know, directing our uh, dollar votes really to food businesses that are doing this work, that are leading this work, that are showing that, you know, this is the new standard. This is how we should be doing business. Um, and, you know, it's well within our power. Definitely money talks and that should really empower consumers to realize that they have a huge role to play in this food loss and waste space. They have a lot of power, they have a lot of opportunity um, and they truly can be change makers. So thank you for joining us, Robert. I, I appreciate you uh, being a change maker, pushing the envelope and, and continuing to have these conversations to expand the ways that that we can reduce food loss and waste and as you said raise awareness and and really make the case for the financial incentives for food rescue and and overall reducing of food loss and waste of course thank you so much for having me on thank you for tuning in to usaid's kitchen sink this podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition.